on page 3. Uh, problem 8 says 5 integers have a sum of 135. One extra number is added to the original 5 numbers. The mean of the 6 numbers is 26 and 1 sixth. Which of the following must be true about the 6th number? So it's multiple choice. And multiple choice um, sometimes makes a problem easier because you can sort of consider the answer choices and rule some things out. In this this kind of a problem, it would actually um, make, in my opinion, make the problem a bit more difficult if you try to start from the answer choices. Um, so let's, let's instead start with the information we've been given. If the five integers have a sum of 135 and we add another number and we know the mean of the six numbers is 26 and 1 sixth, there were quite a few problems we did in class in the scavenger hunt uh, and even before that where we had uh, some set of numbers and one of the numbers was unknown and by by taking the mean but let's look at the, the relationship or the um, the equation we used to determine mean it's the sum of all the numbers divided by the how many numbers we have in this case six the sum divided by six will equal the mean so the, the sum of these six numbers divided by six is equal to 26 and 1 sixth. But we can use the inverse relationship of division and multiplication. Rather than starting with the sum, we can start with the mean. So if, if the sum divided by six is 26 and 1 sixth, then the sum is equal to 26 and 1 sixth multiplied by six. You could multiply both sides of this equation by 6 to isolate the sum and then you're applying the property of equality and of this product will now equal the sum of the six numbers and this is a relatively easy multiplication because 26 and 1 sixth is 26 and 1 sixth if we're multiplying by 6 we just need to distribute the 6 to both terms that's the, the distributive property so uh, this product will equal 26 sixes and 1 sixth of 6. 26 sixes is 120 plus 36 or 156 and 6 six is just 1. So our sum is 157. Our sum of the 6 numbers is 157. The sum of the 5 integers is 135. So we can find the sixth number by just subtracting the 135 from the 157. And that gives you a difference of 22. So we know that the, um, the sixth number equals 22. And once we know exactly what the sixth number is, it's, it's going to be fairly easy to say which of these answer choices must be true about the sixth number. That, that, that word is bolded and underlined for a reason. Some of these answer choices could be true about the sixth number, but only one of them must be true. Um, answer choice A says it is less than each of the other five numbers. Well, could it be? That's interesting. Um, the five numbers have a sum of 135. Could um, they all be greater than this number and still have a sum of 135. Let's make them all their integers. So if they're greater than 22, they have to be at least 23. And if I had five 23s, that would be 115. So they could be, they could be, they could each be greater than um, our number, the sixth number. But must they be? I don't think so. I mean, one of them could be 20, and the others could be higher than that, and they could still have a sum of 135. So A, A, do, A doesn't necessarily have to be true about this number. Um, the sixth number is greater than each of the other five numbers. 
um, not only must mustn't that be true I don't think it's possible because we just said we if we if we think of it the other way if if 22 is the is greater than all five of these numbers then they have to be at least I mean the most they could be is 21 and five 21s would not give you 135 it'd give you 105 so this this couldn't possibly be true um, answer choice C says it's an odd number well we know exactly what the number is it's 22 22 is not odd D it is an even number it must be even because we know it must be 22 so answer choice D I really wish I could circle answers with this thing but I think I need a new writing tablet okay um but I won't do that to be perfectly honest because everyone I've ever tried has some kind of issue like that so I think I'll deal with the circling issue rather than try to work through the software of a new one um, you, number nine says use the line plot to answer the questions below. Um, this whole problem is just uh, checking your understanding of what a line plot is. If you understand that, these questions are, are trivial to answer. The, if we look at the, the title of this line plot, it says daily rainfall in inches. So these three X's above the zero means that there were three days with zero rainfall, zero inches of rainfall. If we were making a list of the data, we could do this. There's a one here. Oh no, I'm sorry. Point one, uh, one tenth. It's not shown, but if this is if this is five tenths, and this is zero. This must be one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, five tenths. How many days were were, were there exactly uh, one tenth inches of rain? None, because there are no x's above. But that's still important information. I mean, that's still useful to know that there were no days at one tenth. So I wouldn't put 0 0.1, but but I did have one day where it was 0 0.2, so that could be my next piece of data. Two days where it rained, uh, three tenths. And I'm not going to make this whole list because it would it would defeat the purpose of having the line plot. But I'm I started to make the list just to remind you that the line plot is nothing more than a list of the data from least to greatest, just given in a compact form um, to save space. And also it's also nice because you can clearly identify the mode, the um, rainfall that occurred the most and things like that so now we can answer the question what was the range the range is the high minus the low the highest rainfall was four and one tenth inches and the lowest rainfall was uh, zero so the range is four and one tenth inches on how many days did it rain more than one inches or more than one inch probably would be a better way to say that it rained exactly one inch on these two days but these would not uh, be included in more than one inch the, the rainfall that's greater than one inch would be everything after uh, that so if we just sort of box in all of the rain all of the days where it rained more than one inch we can just count those X's four and three is seven and three more is ten 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 days with rainfall uh, greater than one inch. Okay, well, uh, let's move on to problem number 10. Problem number 10 says, if all values in a data set are decreased by three, which measure or measures of the data must be affected? Again, with this word must. So. That means one of these measures might be affected with a certain data set, but if you try a different type of data set, maybe maybe it's not affected, and so that wouldn't be included in our answer. Uh, this again, I, I consider this a rather challenging problem. Let's just, I mean, I have to test a data set, so let me just make up a data set, real easy one, one, two, three, four. Uh, let's make it more interesting. Let's give it a mode, one, two, three, four, four. Okay. With this, and really I should use set notation here. Let me do that again. <clears throat> it is a set of data, so I should really use braces here. Okay. Um, the mean of this data set, uh, I don't know, 8, 11, 12, 13, 14 divided by 5, uh, 2.8. I could have made life easier for, for myself and, and chosen numbers that, that had whose sum was a multiple of five, but in any case, that's okay. Um, the median is three. The 
mode, uh, there's one mode and it's four. And the range uh, four minus one is three. Now let's um, decrease each member of the data set by three. So the one becomes negative two, the two becomes negative one, the three becomes zero, and the fours become one. Now the um, mean is going to be, well, it's a sum of negative one. Uh, so negative one fifth or, or negative 0 0.2 for the mean. So the mean changed. Um, the median is went from three, now it's zero. So the median changed. Um, I had a mode of four before, now I have a mode of one. The mode changed. The range before was four minus one is three. Now I have um, one minus negative two. Uh, we're gonna, we've been doing integer operations on your computation go. We will um, take a, a closer look at integer operations during one of our units, but these are things you've done before. Um, subtraction, uh, subtraction, subtracting is the same as adding the opposite. So if I'm subtracting, it's the same as adding the opposite of, of uh, my subtrahend, whatever I was subtracting, and the opposite of negative two is positive two. So one minus uh, negative two is the same as one plus two. So that's three. So my range equals three. So my range didn't change. So I can for sure cross off range. Um, if I can find a data set where the, where this where one of these measures is not affected, then it then it does it can't be included in this uh, must be affected. It must always be affected for it to count as must. And if you really think about, let's look at a number line real quick. Um, here was my original data set. We'll make it a line plot. Um, I had a, a data point here, a data point here, one here, and two here. But when I decrease by three, all I do is let me get a different color. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to shift them, decrease them by three, but show them below the uh, on the same number line. So these two fours becomes become two ones, the three becomes a zero, the two becomes a negative one, and the zero become I mean the one becomes a negative two. So you see these have just shifted to the left by three. And that's why the range is not affected because the difference between the high and the low is three here, and the difference between the high and the low is three here. So range is not going to be affected if they're all decreased by the same amount. You might think that's the final answer, but actually there's, that's what's tricky about this one. We, we created a data set that had a mode. If we instead use a data set with no mode, let's use very similar numbers, but let's just have no mode where they all occur the same amount. Um, again, the range won't be affected. Um, the mean will certainly be lower if they're all lowered by three. We saw that on the previous previous example, as will the median, because the median is a measure of central tendency, and it's going to, if everything shifts down three, the median is going to decrease by three. Um, but what is the mode on this original data set? There is no mode. If I decrease them all by three, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, 3 minus 3 is 0, and 4 minus 3 is 1. What's the mode for this data set? Again, no mode. So the mode doesn't have to necessarily change. If there is no mode, there still will be no mode. So the, the, the two correct answers on this one are mean and median. Problem number four. Analyze the scatter plot below, then describe the correlation, if any, between pumpkin weight and growth time. So growth time is uh, shown as the independent variable, which time typically is the independent variable. Not always, but almost always. And as, as the pumpkin has more time to grow, uh, the, the weight of the pumpkin increases, which makes perfect sense. So this uh, looks like a positive correlation because as the independent variable increases, the, the um, dependent variable also increases. So we would 
we would try, try to draw a line of best fit through the data where, you know, if possible, we have some points going through the line, but more importantly than that, we have just as many points below the line, one, two, three, four, five, probably count that one, also six, as above the line, one, two, three, four, five, six. And in, in uh, future math classes, you'll find out mathematical ways to um, calculate and average deviations and, and, and come up with a, an equation for that line to find the exact perfect line of best fit. But for now, we just need to see, does it really look like it's increasing like this line? Pretty much it does. Um, what I think what's actually happening here um, is more of an exponential function. It's like a curve like this. It's a parabola. And you'll learn, anytime I make too long a line, it kind of runs away on me. But it's it's more of a parabola, so this is an, looks more like an exponential function to me. But you'll learn about that later. But um, as a scatter plot, it... If the in, as the independent variable increases, the dependent variable increases, you draw a line of best fit and you call that a positive correlation. And that does it for page three on the video. We'll pick up the, um, the review with the video for page four on the next video. Thanks for watching.